Divine Truth Assistance Group. These group assistance sessions are about putting principles of divine truth into action. This discussion is part of the 2014 Australia Group 2 series. Jesus Gives Personal Truth to Justin Creek, filmed on the 31st of July 2014 in Monterey, New South Wales, Australia. All right, what we're going to do now is just a quick personal truth session. And I know that sounds funny, me doing something fast, but uh, trust me, it will be fairly quick, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then what I'd like to do is just a bit of a discussion with you. Many of you have asked questions about codependent relationships and relationships with children. And um, so what I'm going to do is a, a summary of relationships in codependency and with children, just to answer all of your questions all at once in the, as a group. Does that make sense? So I'll do that probably for... So this, we're hoping, Mary's going to keep an eye on me in my time, because I'm not, I can't see the clock over there, and she's going to let me know when, when, I'm, when I'm getting near the end. Not to hurry, that's not to hurry Justin, but I feel that we'll be able to identify Justin's issue quite fast. And then we can do about 30 minutes or so with the group about the second question. So, good day. So we're ready to start, everyone's rolling. Everyone's good. Everyone's good. Good day. Well, thanks, Justin, for joining me. Your question uh, was my lack of happiness after being on the path for a few years. There are certain areas where I've grown in love and I can recognize this. However, the happiness and joy eludes me. What am I not wanting to see? It's a very good question. This is a, a, a question that faces most people after hearing divine truth for a period of time, trying to put it into practice, and then they come to this point where they start feeling that they're not happy following the way to God, right? Now, just now we've just had a discussion with Corny, with Cornelius about recognizing addictions in relationships. Does that give you any clues about why you're not happy for the last few years? So I guess for the last few years I've been in a relationship where my addictions have not been met. Correct. Yeah. And before then? Totally met. Totally met. Every totally one of met. them. Yeah. Yeah. And like the difference is the contrast is very great. Yeah. And I haven't, and I haven't dealt with, I haven't dealt very well with not having my addictions met. Yes. Yeah. And, and in a lot of ways, there's still this feeling inside of you, of, I still want them to be met. You just, you just want Ivana, the person that you're now in a relationship with, to meet them. Like, what's going on? Not meeting them. And she, of course, wants a very similar thing from you. Meet them, you know? <laughs> and so, so, so before, when you're in a codependent relationship, all your addiction are getting met. So the actual, the codependent relationship felt better. It was very easy. Yeah. For you, for you. For me, yeah. Yeah. And also quite easy for your wife at the time, right? Now, you heard divine truth. You think about right back to the time when you first heard divine truth. It's from memory, it's almost six years ago now. Yep. 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 And what was the first initial feelings you had about God's truth? Um, I, I guess I was curious. Like, yep. like the truth to me is, I'm very curious about the truth and... I guess I had an expectation of if I applied the truth, which I started to do, that yeah. the outcome would be happy. happy. Yeah, yeah. And and you also look at me, and I'm fairly happy, right? <laughs> so that sort of adds to the impetus that maybe the confusion, if I, <laughs> the confusion now, yes. But it adds to that sort of feeling, doesn't it? Of well, if I do it, like AJ's, uh, Jesus is reassuring me that I'll be happy. Now, at this stage, you didn't believe I was Jesus. So, so AJ's trying to reassure me to be happy. We give it a try. I don't know if I really believe he's Jesus, but, you know, everything he's saying is very logical. It will make sense, so let's give it a go. In the process of giving it a go, you started to confront some of the codependencies in the current relationship, which then meant the relationship eventually separated. 
sorry, the previous the previous relationship. relationship yeah. yeah. At yeah. the moment of separation, there's now no addictions being met at all. Yeah. Right. And this is where the sadness begins for most people. Because they're now no longer getting any addictions met, they've deconstructed or they've tried to work through a lot of the facade, which you have done. You've tried to work through a lot of the facade, which you've tried to do. You've used your willpower to a large degree, yep. you could say, yep. and also some of your will, actually. You've actually used your true soul-based will. You have a desire to be more loving, and that's drawn you along as well in a lot of ways. But, but now there's no addictions getting met. And, and that's why you're sad. Did you think the, sim the answer would be that simple? <laughs> I guess I didn't want it to be that simple. Yeah. Yeah. Now, once we get to this stage, this is a very tricky stage in our development towards God, you see, because we still haven't actually made some soul-based changes that, that will get rid of the actual addiction. Does that make sense? Yep. So you have gotten rid of some, but not, a, not all of them, you see, in the relationship. And there's a lot of very desperate ones that you want met. Right? And, and these, this desperation starts building over time. Right? And we start getting quite uh, distraught that it's now not getting met. And a lot of our sadness is about our addictions not getting met now. Right? And so what, what happens is we, we start <coughs> attempting to get them met. And then we have this belief, I just need to have a cough. <coughs> a lot of people have a belief after I've talked to them about soulmates, that, oh, I'll get my soulmate, I recognise my soulmate, this is what happened and for you. That was you, exactly right? what happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I recognise my soulmate. I'll get in a relationship with my soulmate, and everything. And she should meet all my addictions. Exactly. That's exactly what I did. Exactly what you didn't get. And the opposite happened. Correct. The opposite happened. So now, there's even then questions: Are oh, is she my soulmate? Is she not my soulmate? I don't really know. I'm I'm not very happy in this relationship, you know, because of my addictions. Are not, well, there's not even the recognition that my addictions are not getting met most of the time. I'm just not happy. We seem to be fighting a lot, arguing a lot. There's, you know, we seem to be apart a lot when we could be together. There's not much sex going on. You know, the, you know, there's all these yeah. things all happening as well, which feels very much tumultuous in your life. And because it's the other half of yourself, if you do meet your soulmate in this regard. Then, then there's going to be more challenge actually at the soul level. So there's even more addictions than ever not being met and more challenge occurring at the soul level. So the issue you're facing actually is this. Your addictions aren't getting met. So now you've got to decide what you're going to do about that. And at the moment I don't want to deal with them not being met. Correct. So that's the real reason why you're feeling the sadness and the hopeless feelings that you feel and the feeling of sort of just the general building feeling of unhappiness on the path. Now, one of the things we, we don't realise at this point is that actually the addictions were never good for you but, but because you had most of your addictions met, you believed they were good for you. See, so, you know, on the weekend, you, you got to ignore the boys to a large degree and you got to go out and play some golf when you wanted to and you didn't have to do much with the kids, you didn't have to prepare meals and you didn't have to do a lot of things that now you're having to do, right? Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And, and there's an internal part of you emotionally that's going, I just don't like this. You know? And you're going to have to at some point go through the anger of that. Like the anger, the really angry feeling that you really just. So, firstly, you're going to probably have to go through this tantrumy feeling. You see, you've had your addictions met for a long time, right from childhood onwards, right? Yeah. Particularly with women. Your mum did most of the cooking, preparation, cleaning, ironing, washing, you know. It'd be more than most, it was pretty much all. All, yeah. So, so you've been. She brought you up in this way, and, and this is the damage that mothers do to their sons. They damage their sons for the next for the son's soulmate relationship. And what they do is they teach their sons in this regard 
They teach their sons that they can demand everything from the woman. All of their personal needs will be cared for, including sexual needs, will all be cared for. And then, of course, most of the men go around, oh, I'm really happy in this relationship, this is really good. And what do the women feel? Well, they feel like they're getting used, they're getting <laughs> manipulated, abused, they feel like they don't ever get time for themselves, they don't feel like they're ever... And they feel like they're taking responsibility for the whole family. But, of course, they've been educated to have this role as well. They've been have, educated to have this role. Now, when you were in Afana, she wasn't educated to have this role. <laughs> right? No, she's not. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. And, and also, you know, your children are your children. They're your responsibility. You started learning about that and you started realising you needed to take more responsibility and so forth. But in amongst all of this now, there's a, a large amount of addictions that are not getting met. And this is the problem is when we get a large amount of addictions not met, we get very unhappy, very unhappy. And if we're not careful, and, and, and if we're not careful to see that they are actually addictions not getting met, that is the cause of our unhappiness, we will terminate where we're at at that point, it, relationships, everything, and we will then revert back to a kind of relationship that we had before. Right? So this is little Justin having a tantrum or the beginning of little Justin's tantrum, shall we say. Does that make sense to you? The tantrum yeah. of not having anything met. Now, the sad thing is your, your parents could have done this with you in your childhood. In other words, they could have removed your addictions at a very young age, like even two, three years of age. They could have removed a lot of your addictions and you would have gone through the tantrum then. Would have been a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, it would have been. I agree. But because they didn't choose to do that, and, they, and particularly your mother chose to feed all of your addictions, and the role between your mother and father was especially defined in such a way to feed a male's addictions, then that meant that, that you grew up with a lot of expectations and demands that you were completely unaware of. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, and I, yeah, I guess they became exposed very quickly once my previous relationship terminated. Correct. Um, but even in that, I still wanted to get into another one fairly quickly. And you wanted that new one to meet, to meet many of these addictions. same addictions. Yeah. Does that make sense? And so at the time when you entered the new relationship, you were quite enthusiastic to enter the new relationship. Right? Yeah. But very shortly thereafter, you realised, yeah. ah, this, this is, is, is not a woman that's <laughs> going to meet all of these things that I want, right? Yeah. And then, of course, you start feeling hurt by that. You start feeling like, you know, that's her fault, you know, that, that, that she's not doing those things. And, and the reality is if she truly loves you, she can't do those things. But, but that's not how you feel. And then, of course, there's, there's resentment that builds up sometimes and you feel yeah. angry and all those kind of emotions. And then there's this inner emotional turmoil that begins. And, and, of course, it's very, very hard to manage and maintain while you've still got the addiction. Yeah. yeah. So, so the main reason why you feel that unhappiness that's developed is because your addictions are not being met. You're going to need to go through that as an emotion, the feeling of your addictions not being met, and come out the other side of it, hopefully. Now, this is where it comes down to your will to love. All right? You can choose at this point, and most people at this point that you're in choose the complete opposite of what I'm going to suggest. But you can choose to love and actually work your way through each addiction that you feel. You could choose to do that. Yeah. And that's going to requ require a deconstruction process on each addiction. And, that, and because there's quite a number of them, mostly related to the woman here and mostly related to what you expect her to do for you, yeah, yeah. Um, you're going to find it's quite challenging because there's quite a number of them and, uh, and it might take some time. During the phase where you're deconstructing them and it's taking time, you're going to feel like you're giving up more and more and more happy things and not having anything back in return. But if you allow the connection, once you start deconstructing the addictions, you'll, you'll make a breakthrough through the facade and into the hurt. And the hurt in your case is going to be quite angry, do, do you see? Because, yeah. because you had yeah. all of these addictions met and then they're not met. 
So there's going to be first anger, childlike type anger, and then there's going to be sadness. And the key for you is how you manage that, how, how, you, how you work your way through these issues of anger and the underlying sadness. If you go and project it at everyone around you, which is not working through it, you'll find that everyone around you will desert you completely and then yeah. you'll, be, <laughs> you'll yeah. be even a worse situation. <laughs> if you allow yourself to connect to the anger and, and use it as a method to get to the sadness, if you want, just cry about all the things that you thought you should have. I should have got and should get. And should, get. should get. You still should feel, still you feel should. I should get. Yeah. yeah. And you allow yourself to cry about all those things, then a lot of your hay fever sinus issues will all disappear in that process. And also, you will also start feeling happy again through that process. Does that make sense? Yeah. But if you choose to do this other thing, and that is you say, okay, I've had enough of this now. All I'm going to do now is go back to my old relationship, which many people do, or start a new relationship, which is very similar to the relationship which was filling. In other words, find a woman who will do all of those things for you and then enter a relationship with her. <laughs> you'll find that they'll then be back into the repetitive cycle of the addiction that Cornelius talked to, talked about. You're back, you're back up to the top, you had the compulsion, you met it, and now you're back in the yeah. addictive relationship again without ever breaking this cycle. And I've seen many people do that three, four, five, six, you know, ten times in their life, back into it, back into it, back into it again. It's a, and, and never understanding why they always, all of these relationships always end up failing. Yeah. 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 I don't. I, I don't think I could go back to a relationship like I had initially. No, I, I sort of feel like at the moment you're at touch and go because okay. you are. You still have uh, interactions with your ex-wife, and there is a tendency still to have some of the addictions met through the interaction. So, so you know, okay. there's still touch and go with regard to your choices and decisions. And to be honest with you, you won't know whether you'll be able to go back or not until you feel some of this anger. Because okay. what I find for most people is they start feeling the anger and that's when they decide, no, nah, that's it, I've had enough. And they firmly go back. And they, and they give up the entire truth. They give up divine truth altogether at that point. And we've had many people who we've been quite good friends with do that in our entire life, in the first century, in the spirit world and now. And we've only met many of them many years later, sometimes centuries later. And there's some of our friends from the first century who were in these kind of relationships who, who are still in the hills and we've not met since 2,000 years ago because they didn't want to give up their addictions. Yeah. Yeah. So that shows you, like it depends what you do with the anger. Yeah. That's okay. That, and, I, and I feel quite confident you that you'll address the anger in a more inappropriate way, in a more mm. appropriate ways than most. But um, you don't really know until you go through that phase yeah, okay. as to what you're going to choose to do. Every time you get angry, my suggestion is remember, it's because your addiction is not getting met. So you just keep reminding yourself that. But it's a very hard process. And, and one of the things I'd like to think, help you think about is the process of repentance is a very much more difficult process than the process of forgiveness. And we're going to talk about that in a couple of days. And, and the main reason why that is the case is because when you have to repent for things you've done, it's, it's linked. you've got to do all the things that forgiveness demands as well as all the things repentance demands. You've got to do both things. Whereas when you've just been hurt by somebody else and you haven't been doing the damage by imposing your stuff upon them, in your case, you've had a whole heap of expectations which were imposed upon the previous relationship. Yep. That's doing damage. That did damage to them, but to be frank with you, it did more damage to you than it did to them. And because of that, the process of repentance is a, is a much more difficult process to go through than the process of forgiveness. And, and this is what you need to go through, the process of repentance. In other words, getting rid of the causal reasons inside of you emotionally as to why these demands still exist within your soul. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, and we'll describe more of that in the repentance concepts that we, and forgiveness concepts when we give that talk. So, so I, pro, I suppose in summary, Justin, is what I'm saying to you, the cause of your unhappiness is your addictions and now very few of your addictions in relationship are now getting met. And before, 
pretty much all of them, all of them were, were being met. Yeah. And you haven't um, been consciously aware that your unhappiness is the direct result of your addictions no longer being met. Yeah, I, I thought it was because I hadn't found my desires yet. Yeah, or something <laughs> like that, right? Yeah, and the reality is while the addiction emotion exists within the soul, it's highly unlikely you will find your real desires. Because because your real desires at the moment, your will is being engaged to try to get the addiction met again. Yeah, okay. Does that make sense? So so this is why it's a very critical this is a very critical stage in a person's development. The stage where they've deconstructed a lot of their facade, they've deconstructed a lot of their addictions in the sense of from an intellectual process, they've become more aware, but they've yet to fully go through the emotional experience of deconstructing the facade. They're yet to go through the emotional experience of feeling the addictions properly and actually working their way through them. In Mary's talk, she'll go through that with you. And, and as a result of that, there is this building, building, and intensifying discontentment in their life and unhappiness in their life. Yeah, and that feeling is pretty full on. It is. Sometimes. It is very full on. And, and I've definitely had times when I've wanted to just give check up. Out. Yeah, yeah. And there's also you'll go through even emotions of I just want a suicide. But, but I've had some of those. Yeah, before. yeah. But remember that the suicidal emotions are all about rage. Isn't it? They're all about yeah. anger, right? So even the suicide emotion is, a, is, is not, the, it, it's, it's getting angry with everything and getting angry with life and saying, I shouldn't have to go through all of this, I'm just going to check out. Does that make sense? Yeah, and when I've had those feelings, it does feel like a cop-out. Like I'll have that yep. rage and then I'll go, well, if I did, I don't know that that's going to help me anyway. It's not, it's actually. <laughs> and this is where it's very dangerous for people. I find a lot of people get to that stage, and some of them do consider suicide, and man, they stay in their house for a long time, because, because that's the rage of a person wanting to just cop out of all of their life and avoid the fact that they've got a whole heap of things to solve now in their life. Yeah. yeah. So I would definitely not recommend that path. But, but you will have feelings of that. And the key is to feel them so without acting upon them. That's the key with all of these feelings, is to feel them without acting upon them. You'll feel very angry at times. You'll feel angry with yourself. You'll feel angry with others. You're going to have to have times where you just withdraw from things and just really let yourself express and feel a lot of those things and get to the underlying f f grief that you have. That, that you're not getting what you not want. not getting what I want. I'm not yeah. getting what I want. And once that grief leaves you, you'll find happiness will return. In fact, not only will happiness return, it'll, for the first time you'll actually start feeling happiness. Because what you have now, meeting an addiction, is not real happiness. So you'll actually start to be able to tell the difference between real happiness and the happiness and the that comes or the joy that comes from meeting the addiction. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. So is there any questions about that? No, I think that's pretty clear. Pretty clear? Yeah. It, it's funny, isn't it, how sometimes we look at our life and we go, wow, I've got no idea why I'm so unhappy. And then, uh, and then once we consider just some basic points about w when things happened. So it, it, interesting, in, even in your question, and I find this happens a lot with people, they're asking a question and they don't realise how many clues are in their own question. So can I point that out to you? Yeah, sure. You said, my lack of happiness after being on the path for a few years. There are certain areas where I've grown in love, but however the happiness and joy eludes me. But you said, after being on the path for a few years. Now, if you've taken that down a bit further, you would have been able to tell when the ha unhappiness really started. Really started. Yep. Does that make sense? And if you thought about, when did my unhappiness really start? Initially, I was quite keen. I thought it was. I thought I'd try to give it a go. Everything was quite all right. And then slowly, things started getting more unhappy for me. When did that happen? And you would have started to be able to analyse, and you would start to see. Ah, the more my addictions weren't getting met, the more unhappy I became. Does that make sense? Yeah, it yeah. makes perfect sense. <laughs> and the clue of that is even in your analysis of your life. If you, if you allowed yourself to look back and say, when did my unhappiness really begin? Or when did it start to really take hold of me? 
you would have come to probably see for yourself that actually, ah, that's when I wasn't getting most of my addictions, Matt. And I had an expectation that, like initially in my previous relationship, I was working through some stuff, and that finished. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I've, I've that means done. I've dealt with it all. That means I've. There's got to be some good here. Yeah. There's got to be some happy here, and that yeah. that didn't. Well, there were some things that were good that happened. You know, you you identified firstly that that you didn't have what I would classify as a as a desire that was the same in same in harmony with your wife's desire. You also identified that um, there were certain things that were going on in the relationship that weren't good for your relationship, and quite a lot of things that weren't good for your relationship. You started to identify that you weren't being fair in the relationship. You started to identify that you had a lack of responsibility for your children. Yep. So you started. That. So there's quite a lot of big things in there that you identified. So I'm not, you can't say you haven't made any progress, but where you were getting most of your happiness was from having your addictions met in the relationship, and that's why the happiness, unhappiness, built. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See, when it comes with your relationship with your children, before you heard divine truth, you weren't you weren't not receiving happiness in the relationship with your children. Oh, I was. I wasn't a parent. No, no. You you sort of left that. At that, the was, that was that was job, Jody's totally. job. Yeah. yeah, and and now you could say if you looked at your relationship with the children. You now have a bit more happiness in your relationship with the children. Yeah, you? it's, it's yeah. much better. Yeah, you, you start to you feel them; they're feeling you better. You have better interaction. So there is that area of your life that is improved in your happiness. But but because it's not based around getting many of your addictions met, it doesn't actually make you feel ultra happy. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And and whereas the relationship with your your wife was really where most of your happiness came from. Yeah. Can you remember when you first met her? Um, Your wife. Yeah. I remember when I first saw her. Yeah. And I'm not sure about the meeting part, yeah. but yeah. yeah. And what did you feel when you first saw her? Um, oh, I just thought, oh, wow, she's really attractive. And yeah. Full on attractive, yeah. eh? Yeah. And. Do you realise that in that moment, your soul knew that her soul would meet most of your addictions? I didn't at the time, but when I look back on it now, I go, that was the total reason why it all, yeah, it all happened. Yeah, like yeah. I, I was just looking for someone to meet what I wanted. Exactly. That was the sole reason. There wasn't any. Yeah, you any... didn't even have to know her. You didn't have to speak with her. You didn't have to anything. You could just feel that this was mm. the girl, yeah. right? And that that's very common. And the reason why it's so common is because that that's the person that we often can feel that that's go, that's the person who's going to meet everything I want. It's go, they're going to do everything I want. <laughs> yeah, it's sad, really, isn't it? In a way, in hindsight, yeah, in hindsight, it is. Yeah. So my suggestion is that. Uh, that now you have a choice before you to start feeling some of these addictions and doing some of the work on the real addictions that you face in a relationship and what a woman doing things for you gave you. That, that's where I would start. Yeah. Yeah. What does it give you in terms of your personal awareness of yourself? You know. So how does, that, how does that relate to my lack of relationship with God then? Because I, I, just listening... To Courtney's talk before, I yeah. just had this feeling like I've sought out someone else to meet my addictions because I don't have a relationship with God. Yes, or you could almost say as well that you you don't have a relationship with God because you've got a lot somebody or you've got all these feelings in you that you want the addiction met from met. someone you okay. can see, someone you can touch, someone you can feel, you know. And this is what's happening for many people. They, they don't engage a relationship with God because they want it from a person. The interesting thing I find in that analysis, though, for most people is they don't realise that all of God's emotions are much more powerful than any person's. So the reality is once you actually have a decent relationship with God, the powerful emotion of God loving you, just that one emotion, 
is going to help wipe out a lot of, you know, you have to go through the emotions, but it's going to help go th you go through the emotions of a lot of the unworthy feelings that you have and all those kind of things. You'll feel a lot better through having that relationship. Uh, and of course, God's not going to do it in addiction with you. So yeah. God, it has to be a pure desire. So uh, I find it interesting how a lot of people say, oh, the relationship with God is really hard. No, I'm sorry, I can't agree with that. The relationship with God is really easy. It's the easiest relationship you will ever have because God is not in addiction with you. God doesn't have injuries in love. So the, 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 if you really want a decent relationship, it makes more sense to me to have first a relationship with God because, because God's not injured. So, so it's going to be the easiest relationship you have, actually. But, but, yeah. but while you're holding on to addictions, it's not going to feel that way. Right? But once you give up the addictions, the, per, the other person in a relationship is always probably going to have some. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But with God... The other person in the relationship, God, does not have some, yeah. doesn't have any addictions. So I struggle to feel God because I just want someone to meet my addictions. Correct. Yeah, and it's a big part of what Corny just spoke to us. We, we, we've got to come to understand that. that uh, and in fact, the, the feeling I got from the audience during Corny's talk was that there's this really strong belief that the relationship with God is the hardest possible relationship. And, uh, and it's completely false belief. The hardest relationship, because we're now I'm talking about relationship from a pure sense, the hardest relationships are those with whom you're in the strongest addictions. They cause the most pain, su most suffering. They cause huge amounts of really tumultuous emotions inside of us. And the easiest relationship is the relationship within, with whom we're in the least addictions, and that's God. Because God's got none. So that's actually the easiest relationship. And this is what most people are not realising about their relationship with God. It's it's much easier relationship to develop than any other relationship. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, with the exception of if I'm in addiction. If I'm in addiction, a relationship with God is very complicated <laughs> because God's not meeting any of my addictions and I'm screaming at God to meet them all and God's not meeting any of them. Yeah. So if I want to maintain my addictions, then I'm not going to have a relationship with God. Impossible period. to have a relationship with God. And that's why in Corny's discussion today with recognising addictions in relationships, he said specifically, if you want to have your addictions met, you are not going to have a relationship with God. And this is something that most people are not aware of. And, and if you think about it from a sin perspective, that then makes addictions quite large sins, doesn't it? If we think of the biggest sin possible is really denying or, or, or running away, trying to suppress a relationship with God, because that's the biggest thing that's, uh, that's going to be out of harmony with love in our life. So that's the biggest possible sin we can ever have. I, in the first century, I called it a sin against the Holy Spirit, a sin, a sin against the flow of love from God into the soul. That's the biggest sin we can commit. So therefore, it's going to have the biggest possible consequences on us in terms of our happiness and that's why six fear spirits are still not as happy as they believe themselves to be <clears throat> thank you no worries thanks for your time thanks.